idea with technology. The story begins in May of 1996 when an old friend called me up and asked if I was interested in helping on an air pollution clearing project he was involved with in Denver, Colorado. I'll keep his name quiet since I believe he would want me to. I'll just call him John. This man was a renegade scientist studying all aspects of life in the physical world in a small but sophisticated home lab. I doubt, I doubt his IQ could even be measured as he was clearly a master genius. He had created a new way to see into the reality using microwave emissions, which gave him a tremendous advantage in searching for answers in our world. Even our government, knowing his work, was not able to, able to duplicate it until only just recently. John said that he and his associates, one of whom was Slim Sperling with his incredible coils, coils had found out something about nature that could heal some of the environmental problems of the planet and he wanted me to see what it was. He said that they had cleared up the air pollution in Denver and the air was now pristine. He asked me to come and see for myself. I could hardly believe this since I used to live in Boulder, Colorado, just a few miles from Denver, which at that time in the late 70s had the worst air quality in America, worse than Los Angeles even. It was one of the reasons I'd left Boulder in the first place. Actually, I thought John might be exaggerating, but knowing his intellect and genius, pretty much anything was possible. So I figured, why not? I needed to get away anyhow, and this looked like something that at the very least would be very interesting. I decided to go with an open mind, with no expectations. Even if he said it wasn't true, this trip would bring me closer to the snow-capped mountains of the Rockies, which always made me feel more alive. A week later, I stepped off the plane in Denver into a virginal atmosphere, the lights of which I had rarely seen in my life. It was more like there was no atmosphere. I could see the trees and the mountains in the far distance, 20 miles away. I just stood there like a lost tourist in a strange land, gawking at a cleanliness I never saw in the five years I lived there. To say my interest was piqued was putting it mildly. I was stoked. Could John really have done this? An airport taxi crawled up next to me, the driver exuding a soft, relaxed state of mind. He motioned for me to get in the front seat, as though I was his old friend, and within minutes we were silently gliding towards Slim Sperling's home in the research lab, a place I had never seen before but had heard great stories about. I remember looking into the taxi driver's eyes, and he seemed to be completely stress-free. An unusual quality for a taxi driver. I asked him how he liked Singing his job. Balls. Looking at the road ahead, he said that he loved what he did. To him, people were like open books, telling him stories of their life experiences as they traveled around the world. On this note, he asked me why I was in Denver. I told him I was there to find an answer to the world's pollution problems. He looked at me, this time with a childlike innocence, and said, It's all gone now. Look, no air pollution. I told him I could see that the air was amazingly clean. More than that, he said, everyone I know feels so good. Do you know what happened? I didn't have an answer to his question, and soon we pulled up to a series of two-story apartments on the long street that eventually leads to Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado. Do you prefer going to go into Colorado? This is going to get possible. Here I was to meet Slim Sperling, one of the researchers compiling the experimental information on the new pollution reduction instrument called the R2. This was a magical invention that somehow captured the waveform of a rain cloud. Captured the waveform of a rain cloud just as it was about to lighten and sent it over a 35 mile area, breaking hydrocarbons down into the harmless molecules, oxygen, and water vapor. Was it really true? I definitely felt like it from breathing the air on Slim Street. I knocked and heard Slim yell for me to come on in, and so I did. <coughs> Pardon me. This house was definitely a laboratory, not a place to live, sleep, and eat. It soon became clear that his, that his place to live was upstairs, separate from his researching world. Strange copper coils of various sizes were sitting around on the floor, and there were other things that only God and Slim knew what they were. To this man, who looked like a cross between Merlin with his long white beard and old cowboy searching for a lost cow to herd home, these old coils were actually doing something to help clean up Denver's air pollution. John was not there on the first day, but Slim, his co-inventor, and two other researchers who were testing the equipment were. Soon, the two left for the day, and I was alone with Slim, and could begin to understand the man, who was another genius, as it rapidly became apparent. I stayed with Slim and his colleagues for a few days, learning what they felt and what they felt they could share with me. Here's how the R2 works. Actually, there is more to it, but the following is an approximation. The waveform a, a rain cloud emits, just as it is about to discharge lightning duplicated in a special machine. This is not the R2. <laughs> it is then put on a computer chip in the R2, whose speaker system sends it into the atmosphere through the embedded coil called a harmonizer. The waveform then grows and expands into the shape of a toroidal field like a donor, affecting the gravity waves to clean up the pollution from a distance. The R2 has four dials attached to the end of threaded metal rods, forming a tetrahedron. 
jazz can be used to tune the toroidal field so that it becomes alive. <laughs> <laughs> what? Fuck my mind off. Oh my let's, god. Let's go to Colorado oh my god. and meet this man oh my god. that can heal the energies of oh the world god. with lightning power. <laughs> what did I just miss? That is an amazing mountain. This, basically, the guy has oh, a device wow. that ma makes a toroidal field and a giant star tetrahedron and cleans the air. <laughs> the wave that a rain cloud emits just as it is about to discharge and lightning is due. They put it into a chip, so it's a sound wave which can be played through speakers. If you get good quality enough speakers and this harmonizer thing, you can put that into smaller and smaller devices. And, and just start just planting them everywhere. everywhere. Dude, oh my god, like organize. Yeah, we can just Dude, start can planting get, like, them. Toroidal yeah. field yes. guns. Shit with people. <laughs> <laughs> toroidal field guns? That'd be amazing. Dude. Whoa. Seriously. Whoa. I don't... I don't understand why people aren't just doing things anyway. Why can't we just do it? There is nothing. Hey, they have hey, up and we it. can. We're yeah, we can. It. Everyone needs to like understand that. Fuck the government. Let's just do shit, dude. I've my brain is tickling. Before. Keep going. Oh my god. It was this? I'd seen and felt the power of the R2, and in that instant, I knew for certain that this new experience was real, and I simply had to learn more by direct experience. During this time, especially in 1995 and early 1996, Denver's air became extremely clean while the R2 was running. But the city's EPA took full credit for this phenomenon. The agency said that the measures it took were the reasons Denver's air became so clean. However, I watched as the R2 instantly cleaned large areas of Denver right before my eyes, so I realized that Denver's EPA was simply taking credit for something it had almost nothing to do with. Further, John and Slim had the R2 tested by an independent lab in Fort Collins, Colorado, which proved beyond doubt that the R2 was doing exactly what they claimed it was. The testers had the unit run for a period of time and then they shut it off. They scientifically recorded the pollution dropped while R2 was running and then rose when it was shut off. They did this over and over for a period of, as I remember, about three months. Also, the United States Air Force from Kirkland Air Force Base is watching this experiment, as well as the one that I began in Phoenix, which I will speak about soon and asked if we would submit ourselves and our equipment to their scientific scrutiny. We agree, and those test proofs conclu conclusively that the R2 really did clean air pollution. When we returned to the lab, John and Slim sat me down and offered me my very own R2 to take home to Arizona to experiment with. I have to admit, I felt like a child who had just been given a long-awaited toy. I patiently awaited to be home by myself to begin exploring this unbelievable machine firm. I arrived at home to the Arizona Republican headlines of May 3rd, Describing the horrific air pollution problem that had developed in Phoenix, the governor of Arizona, Fife Stickington, was saying that the pollution in Phoenix was so bad that the city's classification was about to be upgraded to serious. Alerts were issued every wait, few wait. days, and the situation was growing worse each day. Okay. Lots of pollution in Phoenix. In response, Governor Simington had set up an ozone strategies task force, which was headed by attorney Roger Fairland. In reference to finding a solution to the pollution problem, Mr. Fallon said in the Arizona Republic article, I mean everything. There is nothing we won't consider. No matter how radical or wacky or tough or expensive, we will consider everything. Mr. Fallon said that they would absolutely have to clean up Phoenix. The air pollution is going to destroy the tourist trade and affect almost every business in addition to all the health problems this involves. And so I wrote a letter to Mr. Fallon asking him for help. Asking for help in setting up the R2 unit in Phoenix. Since we had scientific evidence that this worked both from an independent lab and from the United States Air Force, and since we were not asking for financial help, I assumed they were listening to us. Boy, was I wrong. In this letter, I simply asked the city of Phoenix to give us a chance to show them what we, that we could do. It. We would pay for all costs, and all they had to do was to acknowledge our presence and monitor what we were doing. I received a phone call from the city by a man named Joe Gibbs, who told me that they were not interested in our R2, and they would not help me in any way whatsoever. You must understand how baffled I was in their response. It was then that I began to realize that the newspaper article was only for show and politics, and that they had no intention of actually cleaning up the air pollution in Phoenix. They turned me down on every level. Fortunately, nobody could stop me from researching, because the R2 simply runs on a 9 volt battery and uses mini, <laughs> mini volts to operate. The federal law says that anything that uses less than 1 volt is unregulated. So on my own, on June 4, 1996, I turned on the R2 in Cave Creek at the northern edge of Scottsdale. The air was so dirty and dry that on a day it was really hard to breathe. It did not rain for months and months, and even some of the cacti were done. For the first three days, nothing happened. Then on the fourth day, a small black rain cloud appeared over my house. In all of southern Arizona, there was not one cloud except this one over my home and the little R2 unit. Then the cloud began to expand and grow in size. 
At the tenth day, the little cloud had grown to about 15 miles in diameter, and for the first time in a very long while, it began to rain. And there was lightning, and man was there lightning, like I had only seen once or twice before in my life. The storm continued for hours on end, with flashes of lightning moving sideways across the sky. The air had a sensuous smell of ozone, and slowly the sky opened up for a downpour of water. From that moment forth, it continued to rain almost every day, cleaning the sky of pollution and filling the rivers and lakes with fresh water. By, se <laughs> <It's a rain laughs> <This God>. is... <laughs> by September 1st, 96, the waveform field created by the R2 was established. And from that day forth, there was no more air pollution alerts, not a single one, until the US Air Force asked us to shut down the R2 to see what would happen. We shut off the machine on May 12, 98, and already by the end of the month, the air pollution had returned and the city had its first alert since 96. During the time of this test, actually we placed a second R2 in the city of Phoenix itself in March of 99, and that is when it began to show results. The hydrocarbon measurements in the city of Phoenix stayed almost always in the single digits. Sometimes in the middle of downtown Phoenix, the hydrogen carbons were measured at zero. There was absolutely nothing, no hydrocarbon pollution. Fortunately, the R2 didn't stop the nitrates, which are the cause of the ozone pollution, but it really helped with the hydrocarbons. It was all a matter of public record. By the end of this test, I knew for certain that the R2 was a success, but the US Air Force, who had been monitoring my operations, entered the picture and asked me to shut down the operation. They wanted to see what would happen at the same time and informed me that the US EPA would never allow what I was doing. They suggested that I go outside of the United States. And so, with the blessings of the US Air Force, I began to experiment in, for in foreign lands. <laughs> <laughs> I love this man! <laughs>